Bobby. Get him. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio. You're just in time to join today's brave conversations with your hosts, Jackie Little Guest, Daryl Williams, and Tony Emma Hill. All right, so so today we're going to start in on a new topic. We're going to talk about that gay manifesto of 1987. And, um, I, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to talk about that because we see the implications of that particular manifesto then that's manifesting in the lives of our people today. So uh, with that, I've invited Latanya Warsham of the Take It to the Max Radio Network to join us. Welcome, Latanya. Thank you. How y'all doing, family? Hello, liturgical. (laughs) (laughs) Liturgical worship. Oh, we're going to sing and dance for us while we talk. <laughs> Not funny. <laughs> Thanks for having me, y'all. <laughs> well, hey, it, what we're doing is brave conversation. So if you're brave enough to join the conversation, we're brave enough to have you. So somebody start us out here. Well, we're going to be discussing a very critical a uh, controversial issue. It really shouldn't be critical or controversial because of the time that we live in when you have all this so-called political correct stuff. Uh, it has become a controversial topic uh, because the, well, the, the people that practice this specific lifestyle have become very politically and financially, uh, they have the financial wherewithal to create a whole bunch of controversy behind this issue. Yeah, I can't agree more. I I would definitely say we need to tap into some of the boldness that comes behind it and also to the uh, activity that has been ignored and neglected to be dealt with in the church. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, let's get this this party started here. Okay. Well, um, we got to go with the Bible. The Bible in Leviticus 19, I believe, says that a man is not supposed to lie with another man and that that type of behavior, which we call homosexuality, an abomination. And today, for some reason, well, I know the reason, but you have a lot of uh, people in society and in the church community that are embracing homosexuality, same-sex marriage, lesbianism, transvestism, and all of these other um, sexually deviant behaviors um, and, and, and embracing these things, even though the Bible has said that it's an abomination. That's right. You know, it's funny we mentioned that, too, because, I mean, according to Scripture, it says, you know, people will become lovers of themselves. Well, that is truly an abomination when it's two men and then, of course, two women. Uh, you know, it's really becoming a disgraceful neglect, and I keep using the term neglect because we're ignoring it. I mean, the churches are literally ignoring it. Ignoring it, I want to know, you know, what exactly are we going to do about it? Are we going to sit by and jump in the closet with them? Well, uh, that was one of my questions. My my concern is our children. Uh, I was raised in the 1970s, and it was clear to me at that time uh, because pastors preached against homosexuality, and they often quoted the scripture in the Bible that said that, or says rather, that it's an abomination. But nowadays, um, pastors aren't really preaching against it. They're embracing it. They even have uh, this, this concept, of this, uh, this thing called liberal theology. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, this uh, Carlton Pearson stuff where, uh, and Joel Osteen, where nobody goes to hell now, uh, and um, we, we love everybody, and we're all God's children, no matter if you're, if you're gay, if you're a lesbian, if you're homosexual. I even heard a pastor say uh, at a church that I used to, to um, be a part of, uh, it's okay if you're, if you're homosexual. It's okay. Come on. You can sit in the pew with your lover. If you're a lesbian, you can sit in, in the pew with your lover, and y'all can love on each other, and you're welcome here. That is the attitude that, yeah. that, that's scattered, you know, in a lot of our churches now. It's like no one wants to preach against it. No one wants to stand up uh, and challenge uh, these notions, these contemporary notions uh, regarding, you know, the church community. Now, forget society at large. The church community embracing homosexuality. Well, let me, let me interject here. When we talk about 
what an abomination is. You know, the, the dictionary defines that as a thing that causes disgust or hatred. And oftentimes you hear the, the rebuttal response of people who are participating in this lifestyle. Their response is often that, you know, they feel like people are spewing hate at them. Is that mm-hmm. the context in which the, the, the Bible speaks of abomination, when, when, when we look at the scriptures and it says that this is an abomination to God, how is that to be interpreted and wielded, if you will, at the hands of a believer when trying to have a positive influence over the lives of the people who choose to? Because that's one, one other thing that I hope that we will if not today, we'll at some point in this series get an opportunity to talk about is the fact that this lifestyle is a lifestyle choice because mm-hmm. nobody is born this way. And that's, that's right. another argument that you hear. So the primary two arguments that, that I've heard over the course of time is, number one, um, if you speak against it, then you're spewing hate. And then, again, we have that word abomination which I think can be somewhat intimidating if you don't understand the the bases in which it is meant and the intent in which it is meant when it's used in the Bible. And then number two is born that way versus choice. So let's have a little dialogue about that. Well, you know, it's like um, if you talk about it, you're, you're spewing hate. So if I talk about a pedophile Am I spewing hate? Hmm. Makes me wonder. But then if I talk about homosexuality, then I'm, that's hate. And as far as you're born this way, um, what you're telling me is God, who hates sin, he loves us, yes, but he hates mm-hmm. sin, decided, okay, you know what? I'm going to make this one a homosexual. Even though I hate that sin, but I'm going to make him a homosexual. Hmm. I got a hard time believing that one. Why would you? Why would you go into the kitchen and bake a chocolate cake if you know you don't like chocolate cake? Why would you do that? Why would you go in the kitchen and, and you know and bake this chocolate cake to eat this, knowing you don't like it? So why would God create? a homosexual knowing that he does not like that sin. So that, you know, I was born this way, come on, really stop using that. You, this is a choice that you had made. You tasted it, you liked it, and you went with it. Now, you may not want to continue in it, and if you don't want to continue in it, then you go to God and ask him to deliver you from this. It is a process. Yes, it is. So, you know, stop using that as an excuse that this is the way I was born. No, mm-mm. I'm sorry, I can't go with that one. There is no scientific data that proves concretely that people are born homosexual. However, mm-hmm. this is where... This is where uh, you, y'all know me now. You know I'm going to come with something. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys are aware, uh, there is a testicide called atrazine. Have you guys ever heard of it? I think I've heard of it. I think I've heard of it. Uh-huh. It's produced by a company out of Switzerland called Syngenta. And I have the information here. It says atrazine is a staple product for producers who use it as a critical tool. We control and grow in the vast majority of corn, sorghum, sugarcane, etc. in the United States. Use of atrazine fights weed resistance, reduces soil erosion, and increases crop yield. Now, I'm going to go down. Uh, a doctor by the name of, let me make sure I get this to you correctly, Professor Tyrone Hayes, uh, the Department of Integrative Biology, at the University of California, Berkeley. Now, you can get all this information online, by the way. This is all, this is all over the Internet now. Uh, who specializes in the study of atrazine calls the chemical a potent endocrine, I'm sorry, endocrine disruptor with ill effects in wildlife, laboratory, 
animals, and humans. You know what the endocrine system is? It's your reproductive organs. It says it's, 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 it's an endocrine disruptor. It says, goes on to say, and I quote, atrazine chemically castrates and feminizes, listen to me now, wildlife and, re and reduces immune function in both wildlife and laboratory rodents, says Hayes. Now, he was um, the person that Syngenta hired to uh, do an analysis, of what, you know, to do some research on, on, on the causation of this, of this pesticide. And these were his findings. It says, who has published research showing that exposure or consumption of atrazine caused male tadpoles to turn into hermaphrodites. It says frogs with both male and female sexual characteristics. Okay, now I can read all of this. It goes on to say that the, the um, uh, crop that atrazine is most uh, uh, primary, primarily used on is corn. Okay, and people that eat and or drink, and then, and then there's the other part of the document that says that what's happening is crops are sprayed with atrazine and rain and, you know, inclement weather causes uh, water runoff, and it ends up in the water supply. When mm -hmm. that happens, People either consume it or they drink. They drink it. It causes homosexual behavior. It causes this is what homosexual. Yes, it causes. <laughs> which is why I stopped eating corn like five years ago, <laughs> and why I always <laughs> drink corn like water now. Um, but what I'm saying is, you can scientifically, based on what this document says, you can genetically modify food, and people are eating food that could be causing some of this homosexual behavior, this upswing, this surge in homosexual and lesbian behavior. Now, mm -hmm. speaking, I'm, I'm going to speak, I'm just going to speak the truth. Historic, and y'all know I read all the time. I've studied a lot of history. I've read Homer. I've read Herodotus. I've read Pliny the Younger. I've read Josephus. I've read J, uh, J. Rogers. I've read Ivan Van. I can go on and on and on and on and on. We're discussing African culture or the black man's history, homosexuality is almost not even heard of. There are countries in Africa right now, if, they, if, if you even, if they even think you're homosexual, they, they take you, they get rid of you. <laughs> they, don't, they don't play that. But now you have the United States government mm -hmm. going into countries and demanding that these countries embrace homosexuality. Oh, yeah. Did y'all hear what oh, I just yeah. said? Mm -hmm. And I want to add to that, you know, Daryl, the amazing thing uh, also in addition to what Tony was asking us, you know, how do we look at that and Jackie in reference to what you were saying, you know, God never uh, told us to love the sin. He told us to love the sinner, you know, right. so we, we don't love the sin. We judge the sin. We are responsible as Christians to uh, not hate the sinner, but to love the sinner, but to call the sin out. So, you know, according to the word, that is, you know, fact. I mean, God's word always will and always does have final authority. But in reference to the gay manifesto with um, Michael Swift, I want to read something real quick. He said on, uh, in 1987, and this is something we really need to be in prayer about as a church, as an individual, as a believer, as a mother, as a, as a father. He said, we shall sodomize your sons. Emblems of feeble masculinity, if you're of your shallow dreams and vulgar lies, we shall seduce them in your schools, in your dormitories, in your gymnasiums, in your locker rooms, in your sports arenas, in your seminaries, in your youth groups, in your movie theater bathrooms, in your army bunkers, your truck stops. They go on and on and on. They said we have what they call, and this guy is the gay activist, Michael Swift. He stated that we are filled with ferocious bitterness. And he said, all churches who decide that they are going to try to condemn us, we will shut their doors. This is no joke here. So if we, in fact, as a church, if we, in fact, as a people, don't come together and make some quality decisions together, united, regarding what is peaceful and what is holy and what is righteous before God, we, we are really going to suffer some consequences like we've never seen before. Wait, 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 wait. Let's go back. Let's go back. <laughs> I'm glad you went there. One thing we need to clearly establish before we deal with this manifesto, and here's the critical point. Up until 1980, see, I come with the science. 
I come with the facts. Up until 1980, the American Psychological Dictionary defined homosexuality as mental illness. That's what it was. That, that's what it was defined as. That's what it was known as. Okay. Uh, so what changed? What changed? And see, the gay man is the agenda. Frankly, oh, yeah. when, when, but, but check it out. When you can call it something mental, then that justifies the fact that now that it's considered something that we need to accept and we need to embrace. That is not true. That is not so, and that's not, that's not of God. We know this. I'm going to tell you what has changed since 1980 is that, and Latonya, you just read exactly the core of it, is economic gain. Yes. Yeah. The, the need for economic Economic gain. That's right. That, that, that is the fear that causes people to shut their mouths because that manifesto, that agenda, the now agenda, is to shut your doors, to to boycott your business. Let's go back to what happened with was it Chick Fil A when they were yeah. trying to and when they were trying to openly boycott Chick Fil A for what their uh, founders positions were with regard to the gay and lesbian lifestyle. So at the core of it all, the only thing that has changed, you know, to, to, to make them start looking at that definition a little differently, to try and make it more accepting, to try and shut people's mouths from talking about it, is the fear and the, of the loss of economic gain and economic wealth. That, that, that's, that's, that's at the core and at the heart of it all. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, they talk about even the Houses of Congress, you know, where men will gather together. He even made the comment, he said, ladies, if you if you want to be uh, and live with one another and be together, then go on and be together because more than likely, for all you know, you might be sleeping next to somebody that's gay yourself. Oh, he went in. Yeah, and see, I, I'm going to stick with the agenda thing because I, 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 I got to quote somebody here. I think it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, uh, and this is a political issue as well that we're talking about, so i got to go here. He said, in politics, nothing happens by accident. He said, if it happens, it was planned. So this is an agenda. And I think we need to tell people, we're, we're talking about the gay manifesto, we need to tell them where they can find it, because you can find it online. Uh, it was first published in the Gay Community News, February 15 through uh, 21 in 1987. Correct. Okay. I'm looking at so, it. anybody that wants to find this online, because you know sometimes people want they they want something tangible they can see. Um, that's where you can find it. You can find it online. You can read it yourself. You can read it in its entirety. And when you read it, look at what's going on in society today, in the media, in the print media, in the movies, especially with the African American community. All these uh, athletes coming out, so-called coming out, and all, all the pop and circumstances involved where the media continues to focus on this over and over and over. Like, this is a big deal. And, you know, uh, even the president uh, says, oh, I just want to applaud this person and acknowledge this person for coming out and affirming his homosexuality. Right. Look at all the things that happen today. And, 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 and um, juxtapose or uh, compare that, I should say, with, uh, with the manifesto as it's written. This is right. the agenda. This oh, is yeah, the we agenda. understand. Yeah, don't get, me, don't get me wrong. I understand that this is the agenda, but also this is brave talk. And with it being brave talk, we've already addressed the problem. Now I want to know, everybody, what do we see as a solution to the problem? Well, you know what? Um, as you said, economic gain. Okay, we, we know that as far as sinners, we expect that because it's sin. That, that's expected as a sinner. But when you bring it into the church and it is accepted in the church, then we got a real big issue going on. Because we are throwing this in, blatantly throwing this in God's face and say, okay, God, here it is, accept it, and let's move on. But me personally, I think it has to do with money as far as the church is concerned. Now, if it was a group of people who were poor and, you know, they just they were just 
the lows, you know, whatever, would we accept it as much, you know, as we would if these affluent people who can give all this money to the church, who can do this for the church, who can do that for the church, would we accept it as, as you know, like we would for them? I don't think so. So I think mm-hmm. it's a money thing because we need, we want your money. So we're going to let you go on in here and sit with your lover and hug up on your lover as long as you write that check, as long as you give this, as long as you can do this. And we are accepting it because the money comes with it. You know, at one time, you know, these big-time athletes and politicians, they would never say, I'm gay. That was unheard of. But now that they're talking about it and they're allowing everyone to know, here I am, oh, well, you know, come on in. I'm not going to turn you away. Right. Right. And And it is a limit. That's right. It is. Well, also, when you look at the behavior itself, it's not productive. It's counterproductive. Uh, there's no life being uh, uh, procreated when you engage in that type of behavior. So it is a form of genocide. Or, again, another document people need to read is the Global 2000 report uh, that was um, composed in um, 1980 by Henry Kissinger. We're talking mm-hmm. about ways of freeing the lands, uh, especially in, in places like Africa, of their populations. And it, uh, it says in that document very clearly that homosexuality should be encouraged as a means of population control. That's a part of it as well. All right. Um, exactly. I, let's deal with the church, though. <laughs> oh, I was hoping y'all didn't, y'all didn't get me in yeah, because I, I think that that's a crucial area, Daryl, because um, when I read in the news, I'm looking at Nancy Grace, and she's talking about boys being molested in a McDonald's in Dallas, Texas, and two other boys in a church in Australia, uh, a child as young as two years old being molested by two gays that they've adopted. We've got a real problem because think about it. This could actually happen in our churches while you're sitting down in church. You do realize that when you embrace homosexuality, that's only a stone's throw away from pedophilia. <laughs> you do realize that. Absolutely. And, and, and this society has embraced wholeheartedly embraced homosexuality. Pedophilia, is next. as a matter of fact, uh, I did some research uh, last week. Germany and the European Union voted to legalize pedophilia. Did y'all know that? Yes. Yeah, they, they, they voted to legalize. Also, when you, well, now when you accept pedophilia, once again, you're only a short walk away from bestiality. You guys do know that in Switzerland okay. and Germany, they have what's called animal brothels, where these rich oh, yeah. white men and soon black men, because we do everything they do, uh, fly over there to have sex with sheep. Y'all know that? And then you have people online now coming out uh, openly talking about uh, engaging in intercourse with dogs, with horses, uh, oh, yeah. with with, uh, with cows. <laughs> so you all see you. Op- they've opened up this Pandora's box now, where everything mm-hmm. is going to be legal and. Ex- but now, if you go back, let's go back. Let's go back. Um, well, I think man, gonna- before we go, before we go back, before we go okay. back, what I do want us to do is. I don't want to take for granted that people know what these terms mean. So when we talk about uh, pedophilia and pedophiles, let's be sure that we explain exactly what that is. When we talk about bestiality, let's explain and define exactly what that is because we want to be sure that the listeners have in their mind the same concept and the same understanding of exactly what we're talking about. So. Let's define those things. Well, pedophilia is, is, is sexual intercourse with a child. Okay, that's what that is. Bestiality is the sexual intercourse uh, and emotional attachment to an animal. It could be a dog. It could be a goat. It could be uh, a, a, a cat. It could be uh, <laughs> a, a, a sheep. Uh, and these kind of things do go on. I know when I was at, I, I worked at Howard, um, and I'm sorry, Harvard University, and I had access to this library. And when I went in there, I couldn't really understand the language in the books, but there were pictures of sheep with human, you know, faces. 
and all this kind of stuff. And I didn't understand yeah. that. Yeah, I've never been exposed to any of that craziness. But now that I've, you know, done a little research and, you know, up to speed on a lot of things, that bestiality, when you have intercourse with an animal um, and, you know, you know, you know the procreation process, the egg fertilizes, the worm fertilizes the egg, um, you know, all this kind of insane stuff, uh, you know, occur. And that's where those pictures, I didn't, I didn't understand it back then, but I do now. But mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're in for a rough ride, buddy. <laughs> well, yeah, if, if, we don't, if we don't begin to start doing what the Word of God says, because that's the real issue. I think personally the core, I think you guys talked about a few weeks back when you talked about the mind, you know, the mind of people, you know, where their minds are corrupt. So they don't desire to even do what you're doing, Daryl. For example, research, get the information, read, you know, reading being fundamental, actually knowing their history, knowing why they do what they do. People don't look at those things anymore because they, they expect someone like yourself to just give them the information and then they just say, oh, okay, thanks for that information. But they don't plan on doing anything about it. And that's why I kept putting such an emphasis on the importance of people getting the knowledge but then being willing to act upon it. You know, I looked at something where uh, Diane Sawyer in, 19, I think, 90, she was interviewing Clive Davis, and he was talking about how he decided he was going to experiment with sex after the age of 50. And he said, you know, she asked him, she said, did you have a problem with the fact that, I mean, were you embarrassed that you were uh, involved or engaged in sexual activity with other men after being married to three other women? He said, you know, after a while, I didn't think anything of it. In other words, people are starting to neglect the fact that there's anything wrong with sin. Forget the fact that it's sex. It's the fact that sin in and of itself is becoming embraced overall everywhere. Mm-hmm. Let's look at the church, though. You have gay pastors now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, have... I, I'm talking about the church, really. Because, about... I mean, think about it, the church is still embracing it, too. And now we got folk trying to sue one another. Come on. Yeah, you have open and affirming and avowed uh, pastors that are uh, male pastors, mar- married to other male pastors, pastoring churches. Uh, women Correct. that are lesbians, uh, that are married, I, 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 I've seen a few uh, pastors churches. You churches in Atlanta. You know about those churches in Atlanta, the gay churches in Atlanta where they have first gentlemen now? Yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah, this is that's the, online. Yeah, this is almost, and see, this is, this is where this is dangerous, and this is, what I, this is what, why I say, what do I tell my child? Because when I was coming up, we were taught about Sodom and Gomorrah. We were, taught, we were taught that over and over and over again that God got sick of it and, and destroyed Sodom and, and Gomorrah. And, you know, along with the scripture that says it's an abomination, now no one preaches really about Sodom and Gomorrah no more. No one stands up, and if you do, there is one person. I won't call his name. He's uh, campaigning right now uh, against uh, some of the uh, uh, stuff that's going on in a, in a, a, web, a very familiar uh, denomination, and he's being persecuted to the hilt by the preachers. Uh, you got you got pastors, uh, and black pastors now, uh, involved in pedophilia, having sex with little boys. Yes, okay. you do. Uh, it's, 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 so my thing is, it's a rhetorical question for me, because I, and I say, what do I tell my child? I tell if mm-hmm. me personally, I tell my daughter what, what Joshua, Joshua said, uh, choose you this day <laughs> who you going to serve. You know, you can choose, choose what, choose what you're going to do. If you're going to get down yeah. with that, how you are and who you are and what you want to be into and all that kind of stuff, and you can come up with all the excuses, you know, you won't say you were going that way and all of that. Choose you this day who you're going to serve, but as for me and mine, mm-hmm. I'm going to serve. That's, that's all I can do. That's, that's all you can do. And, 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 of course, be in prayer because, you know, we, there's so many crevices and areas that, that need to be tapped in concerning this. I mean, we haven't even begun to deal with the area of down low. So, I mean, we can go on and on and on, but you're absolutely right. What do you tell your daughter when she goes in the classroom and, and another child says, hey, my mommy, we have two mommies in my house or we have two daddies in our home, or I've been adopted, and they touch me and they hug me and they embrace me, and your daughter's looking like, what do I do? I mean, so it's a lot of different issues. We're, we're leaving stones unturned in the church. 
Well, it is very right. important to make a, to, it's very important to make a stand, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Latanya is dead on it. I took my daughter and one of her friends one day to the Discovery Zone, and we left the Discovery Zone, and we're walking down the um, down the, the you know walking downtown. I was taking them down to the African American Cultural Center, and as mm-hmm. we're walking, headed in that trajectory, these, these two these two men walked up and they're hugging on each other, kissing, and my daughter kind of squeezed my head because my daughter knows how I feel about that. But her, who she thought was her friend at the time, says, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> and I turned and I looked at her. She's not my child, so I didn't say nothing to her. And but then she mm-hmm. says, well, what? I said, but that, that behavior is, is out of order. I said, I, I, when she asked me, I told her. Then I, I, I dropped my daughter off. And before my daughter got out of the car, I said, now, you know your daddy, you know how your daddy, yes, dad. I, I said, you need to lose her. You need to lose your friend. You, she don't need to be your friend. Because I teach my daughter that birds of a feather flock together. And shortly after that, my daughter dropped her. <laughs> up the camera. Because <laughs> daddy told her, uh-oh, we don't, we ain't know that ain't you. The men ain't supposed to be kissing men. That's not natural. That's abnormal. That's anomalous behavior. It's, 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 it's profane. My daughter knows how I feel about that. And you've got to make that stand. You can't vacillate either. I don't vacillate. My daughter knows that my yay is yay and my nay is nay. I'm either with you or I'm against you. And if you are not standing upon uh, the Bible, and Bill, I'm talking, and, and this is in reference to pastors, there's no way you can get me, okay, there's no way you can get me to, to, to uh, uh, get down with a gay pastor. There's no way no, no, a man, uh, a pastor of a church who's gay or a woman who's a lesbian is going to be my leader, my pastor. Yes, we, we, I, the, very first show we, the, the very first show we, we did, I said, I quoted the scripture that says, follow me as I follow Christ. How does that follow in Christ? That's you right. can't That's right. that out of that situation. There's no way you can get that out of. There's no way, you know, he, he's following Christ if he's gay or if she's lesbian. There's absolutely no way you can justify that or rationalize that. People have to decide what they're going to stand on, and if they're going to stand That's on right. the world, you know, they need to, you know, keep it moving if they encounter people like that, that are pastors, that are leaders, in, you know, of congregations. I just want to say that we always have to remember sin is sin. In the eyesight of God, there's no big sin, little sin. It's all sin. Now, if my pastor is the the biggest fornicator on earth, to me he's in the same boat as him being a homosexual. To me. That's right. Because it's still sin. So I don't want anybody to think because, oh, because he's a homosexual, I'm against him. No, it's not because he's a homosexual. It's because he's sinning. And he That's right. You know, a That's why I said we judge the sin. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Not, not exactly. You are a sinner when you, you know, um, in, involve yourself in these things. And in the eyesight of God, a liar is nothing smaller or bigger than a homosexual. So please, those of you who listen, don't think just because he's a homosexual or she's gay or lesbian or whatever, that they're committing a bigger sin than the than the one who tells a lie. It's all the same in the eyes of God. But the homosexual agenda is on the table. That's why it's being spoken about so much. That That's is right. what is on the table right now. That is what yeah. is being thrown into our faces to accept. Not the liar, the fornicate. You know, you can fornicate all day long and, and nobody has a problem with that. Nobody has a problem with you talking about it. But it's a touchy situation when we talk about homosexuals. Why? And I'm talking to church folks. Why is that a touchy situation when we talk about homosexuals? But when I talk about a liar and a cheater, it doesn't bother you. Why? Mm, That's good. Yeah. And and I think for me, from what I sense just in the the different things that I hear in the media, the different things I hear, um, you know, through the news, the different things that I see people post through the social media networks, when we talk about the gay, homosexual, lesbian agenda, that agenda is to push to be a protective class of people. And that's why there's such a touchiness around it. That's why it's such taboo to have discussions like this 
for fear of repercussions because, you know, number one, as I said before, the economic gain, but number two, you're going against this agenda and this push to be a protected class of people. You know, when we traveled to Nigeria in the summer of 2015, we clipped a article that was posted in their newspaper because to be homosexual in Nigeria is illegal. In fact, in that article, there's a big caption on it, and it says, same-sex marriage, a rape of God's law, and evil against natural order. That's how they classify it. That's how they view it. Daryl, when you were talking before about the two men kissing, it's out of order. It's out Side of the natural order of what God has ordained and his intent for the creation of man and woman. He created us to procreate. You cannot procreate with another woman if you're a woman. You cannot, if you're a man, procreate with another man. That totally nullifies the, uh, the, the be fruitful and multiply commandment that God gives us in the book of Genesis. So when we come back from the break, what we're going to talk about is this push, this agenda to be a protective class. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio at TonyEmmaHale.com. This is Daryl Williams of Brave Talk Radio coming at you with another Black History Moment. And today we're going to celebrate and acknowledge the legacy of Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, brilliant woman whose work transformed my life and the lives of millions of black people all over planet Earth. Dr. Frances Cress Welsing was born on March 18, 1935 in Chicago, Illinois. She received her bachelor's degree at Antioch College and her MD at Washington, D.C.'s Howard University College of Medicine. She was an assistant professor of pediatrics at Howard University's College of Medicine when her Landmark Theory, the Crest Theory essay was publicized. Welsing is best known for composing the ISIS papers, Keys to the Colors, one of the greatest books ever written, and I read it five times, I know, and is the originator of the, quote, melanin theory, and, quote, the neurosis, unquote, of white supremacy. The Howard University graduate wrote essays and did extensive research on colorism, racism and inequality and often exploring concepts of white supremacy in her works. Her research done throughout the early 1970s into the 1990s was controversial at the time, but it focused on white racism while offering a theory of black pride based on levels of melanin. In her 1970 essay, The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism White Supremacy, Welsing wrote, quote, the quality of whiteness is a genetic inadequacy or a relative deficiency or disease state based on the inability to produce the skin pigments of melanin, which are responsible for all skin color, unquote. Adding, quote, the majority of the world's people are not so afflicted, suggesting that the state of color is the norm for human beings and its absence is abnormal, unquote. Welsing would later spend more than 20 years working as a staff physician for the Department of Human Services in Washington, D.C., and as the clinical director of two boards of schools for emotionally troubled children. She was a specialist in child and genetic psychiatry, and she began her private practice in D.C. in 1967. She was a member of the National Medical Association, the American Medical Association, and American Psychiatric Association. Quote, I put the discussion of melanin on the board in order to describe how pigmentation was a factor in what white supremacy behavior was all about, unquote. Welsing noted in an interview with Michael Eric Dyson, quote, if I had my way, there wouldn't be all the discussion about melanin. I would say, quote, discuss white supremacy, unquote. Her research was groundbreaking, yes, Lord, in opening modern day dialogue about colorism and racism in America. Ultimately, Welsing believed that the key to eradicating racism lies in self-respect, self-love, discipline, and education. Quote, we must clean up our neighborhoods, unquote, she told Halliburton. Quote, we must revolutionize ourselves. Whether white people are consciously or sub subconsciously aware of it, they are behaving in a manner to ensure white genetic survival. We must know the truth, and the truth is the first step towards real strength. Dr. Francis... Press Welsing. 
This has been a Black History Moment with yours truly, Daryl Williams, Brave Talk Radio. It's Brave Talk Radio on TonyEmmahale.com with your host, Daryl Williams, Jackie Little Guess, and Tony Emmahale. Well, we're back on Brave Talk Radio, praise the Lord, and it's, it's good to be uh, talking brave. And uh, before we left, uh, evangelist uh, Tony Emmahale was talking about the Word of God. Now, see, when you say the Word of God today, that's almost ambiguous now, because because of this gay manifesto and this homosexual agenda that's being pushed even by the United States government and its president. I'm going to say that again. It's being pushed and embraced wholeheartedly by the United States government and its president. You also have to consider the fact that they now have a gay Bible. So when you say the word of God, they believe, the gay community believes their Bible is the word of God. And in their Bible, Mm -hmm. there's two supreme examples of, of their behavior that they count that they believe uh, is, is, is what that they believe is the truth. Number one, they believe that Jesus and John, they believe Jesus was gay. They say... Hey, hey, that yeah. hey John, I see, I see it says Queen James Bible. Queen? Yeah, Queen James Bible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, in, that, in that Bible, in that Bible, they believe that Jesus is gay. They say that Jesus had a homosexual relationship with John. They also say that David, King David had a, uh, a homosexual relationship with Jonathan. They also say that King James, uh, and this is partly true, by the way, King James, who the Bible is named after, was a homosexual. Uh, one of the Bible writers, uh, uh, Sir Francis Bacon. Uh, uh, you, 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 I mean, so there's a whole, when you say, when you, you need to be very clear what you're talking about when you say the word of God. Because if they have an agenda and they have their own Bible, they believe their Bible espouses the word of God. We need to be very wow. clear about it. You're absolutely you know, right. This all, well, this all goes back to, how could you say that the, the true word of God is not the true word of God? Because all this has been prophesied for thousands of years ago that we were going to come to this. So as a believer, we should not be surprised at any of this because the word of God already told us this is what was going to happen. But just because we know this is going to happen doesn't mean we sit on our hands and just let it fly on by. Mm. I agree with that. I, I just think it's amazing that Daryl brought it to our attention, and I believe many of us were not even aware. I, I'll be the first to admit, I was not aware. So, you know, say not to be surprised, you know, it, it's amazing. I, I am surprised. Yeah. yeah. But the Bible also says, it says to us who are, who, who are, who are uh, the true believers, it says, be, be steadfast. <laughs> and unmovable, always abounding, always abounding. I don't even need to say no more. Be steadfast mm-hmm. and unmovable, always mm-hmm. abounding. All right? That's what it says. That's right. That's, okay. that's part of our, our challenge. I mean, it, it's hard. It is hard. You have to be that's determined. Right. You have to be focused. Because uh, you can have, you can. <laughs> It, it's hard. It's, it's a challenge. It's a major challenge. It is. You're so right. That's why it's so important to have a relationship with God. Because if you don't have a relationship with God, you are bound to, to go and listen to any and everything. That's why we have to watch, you know, the, the eye gate, the ear gate. We have to guard those things. Because if we don't have a true relationship, we will allow any and everything come into those gates. And once they enter those gates, God only knows what will happen next. We will be out there doing the same thing that we are talking against right now, a relationship. Yeah. Mm. And I just want to share a scripture in Proverbs sixteen twenty five, where it says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the Thank end you. thereof is the ways of death. The ways of death. Yes. Well, that's what homosexuals have to do. It's genocide. It's a form of genocide. It yeah. is, and, and ultimately it will lead to the death of our existence because, again, you cannot procreate man with man, 
No woman would think. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio at TonyEmmahale.com. <laughs> 